This is the bread come down from heaven, and this is the cup of everlasting life. Father Thomas Reese is the kind of priest Cardinal Ratzinger saw as a threat to the church. The body of Christ. His crime? Publishing a magazine. In 1998, I became editor-in-chief of America Magazine, which is the National Catholic Weekly magazine published by Jesuits in the United States. And I tried to encourage a conversation, uh, a dialogue, a debate in the magazine about issues uh, facing uh, the church. Among the topics? Gay marriage and abortion rights, issues that were repellent to the conservative cardinal who saw himself as the guardian of church doctrine. I knew that some of the issues that we published in America were controversial, but I always made sure that we had people who uh, supported the Vatican line. For example, I even had uh, a couple of articles by Cardinal Ratzinger uh, himself. Despite that, publishing views that dissented from church beliefs became grounds for firing in Cardinal Ratzinger's eyes. It's public knowledge that Cardinal Ratzinger uh, uh, asked uh, that I uh, be removed. Open debate is just not something that Joseph Ratzinger was comfortable with. He was so concerned that the church have a unified front and everybody knew where the church stood. And if you weren't on board with that, then you were out. Cardinal Ratzinger's campaign against priests who strayed from strict church doctrine was so aggressive that the press dubbed him God's Rottweiler. Vatican experts say Ratzinger silenced, censored, or otherwise punished dozens of theologians during his reign at the CDF. He was easily the most polarizing figure in the Catholic universe. I think Catholic conservatives uh, thought of him as their champion. And for Catholic liberals, this guy was the Darth Vader of the Catholic world. Cardinal Ratzinger was passionate about stamping out dissent, but there was never any public indication he was passionate about getting rid of pedophile priests. And I've seen evidence of this in my life as a, as a cleric, that the Vatican is much more interested in how you think rather than how you act. That's what they're more concerned about. They're obsessed with that. For Ratzinger, the cure to the sexual abuse crisis was to faithfully follow strict church doctrine. So for him, tightening up on belief and on orthodoxy and on a proper spirituality would necessarily be the first step in curing things like sexual license and sexual abuse by, by priests. Father, hear the prayers of the family you have gathered here before you. So Father Reese was seen as a threat to the church and Ratzinger moved forcefully against him. However, for a pedophile priest, it would be a different story. In 1989, Bishop Daniel Ryan drove about 45 minutes north of his diocese office in Springfield, Illinois, to the town of Lincoln. He came here to Lincoln to visit one of his priests, a priest who was living here in a prison. In 1985, Father Alvin Campbell pleaded guilty to multiple charges of sexual assault on boys as young as 11 years old. He was sentenced to 14 years in prison. Matt McCormick was one of the children Campbell abused. I don't come by the school, and I don't come by the church. Starting in seventh grade, Campbell molested McCormick in the church's school, the rectory, and even here. This is the confessional you were in? This is the confessional. And he would sit there. Campbell was sent to prison, but he was still a priest. That's why Bishop Ryan had come to visit him, to try to convince him to voluntarily leave the priesthood. Campbell refused. So Ryan turned to Rome for help. He sent copies of Campbell's indictments, spelling out in graphic detail what Campbell had done to his victims, and asked Joseph Ratzinger to defrock Campbell. Ratzinger's answer, no. The petition in question cannot be admitted inasmuch as it lacks the request of Father Campbell himself, which is called for by the current norms. Incredibly, what Cardinal Ratzinger was saying was that he could not agree to defrock a priest, even a convicted child molester, without that priest's permission. We showed the letter to Matt McCormick. It was the first time he'd seen it. I'm sorry, I have to read this again. What's the first thing 
you would say to Pope Benedict if you were face to face with him? What would I say to him? I'd say that what you've done is created an environment for pedophiles and molesters of children to exist. And the violation of these children falls on your shoulders. Monsignor, do you see though how it sounds so ridiculous? Under our canon law, unless he requests it, we can't defrock him. It would sound ridiculous if you forget the next paragraph which says there is a way of reducing him to delay state and it is by church trial. Ratzinger's letter does say the bishop can avoid responsibility for keeping Campbell by putting him through a church trial. But again, that would take years, and Campbell had already been convicted in a criminal trial. Shakluna admits the process needed changing. I think that these cases certainly thought Cardinal Ratzinger, his collaborators, um, that something needed to be done, and something has been done. Today, canon law has a different scenario, that this thing would not happen under today's canon law, and that is also the merit of Cardinal Ratzinger, who is Pope Benedict XVI today. Campbell would finally be defrocked three years later, after he eventually agreed to request it himself. After bouts with depression, alcohol and drugs, McCormick today is happily married with a daughter. Want to give mama a kiss? And a wife yes. who gave up on the church. We've both converted to, to Lutheranism because of this. I don't, I personally, I don't have faith in the Catholic Church whatsoever, at all. Coming up, a change in attitude? The failure in the Campbell case, which is being left, and I think rightly so, at the feet of Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger, was the very problem that Cardinal Ratzinger, later on in his career, went to John Paul II to resolve. By 2001, the sexual abuse crisis was beginning to engulf the Catholic Church. But Pope John Paul had not addressed the crisis. Priests in the U.S. were being put on trial for abuse, even rape. Lawsuits against the church were piling up. One diocese in Texas was forced to pay millions to victims. The era of denial was clearly over. Ratzinger finally convinced his boss that we've got to start doing something. He knew the, 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 the sword of Damocles, the media scandal, was coming down. The Pope gave Cardinal Ratzinger and the CDF the power to cut through the bureaucracy and handle all sexual abuse cases directly. John Allen believes Ratzinger underwent a kind of conversion. Reading those case files with the detailed notes they contained about the testimony of victims over and over again convinced him that this wasn't just about smoke, that there was genuine fire here. And from 2001 forward, the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith became the beachhead in the Vatican for an aggressive response to the crisis. Still, Ratzinger seemed defensive in public. In 2002, he told reporters the U.S. media had exaggerated the crisis. He said, one comes to the conclusion that it is intentional, manipulated, that there is a desire to discredit the church. But behind the scenes at the Vatican, Cardinal Ratzinger was making waves. The new rules gave him the power to jumpstart the process for defrocking priests. They began to process hundreds and hundreds of cases uh, from around the world at a pace that by Vatican standards is absolutely astonishing because the typical working philosophy in the Vatican is talk to me on Wednesday and I'll get back to you in 300 years. He became increasingly active behind the scenes. Even though he wouldn't push the envelopes, even though he wouldn't cross his superiors, he began pushing 